over to Jessica Forrester. If you don't know Jessica, she was actually a key player in our keynote demo just a couple years ago. She's one of our key core contributors to Kubernetes as a whole. She leads a team of people within Red Hat working on OpenShift to make Kubernetes and OpenShift vastly easier to use. So Jessica, over to you. Hi, thanks, Burr. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Let me get started sharing here. All right. Uh, so I am Jessica Forrester. I'm an architect on OpenShift. And similar to Clayton, I've been working at Red Hat on OpenShift from the pre-Kubernetes days. Um, and I'm going to talk about how Kubernetes, it doesn't have to be hard. What's Kubernetes the easy way? So Kubernetes doesn't have to make you feel this way. And I hear a lot, oh, it's so hard, it's complex, there's too much YAML, right? So, but instead of talking to you in slides, I'm gonna show it to you. So we are going live with demo time for the rest of my talk here. Now, to get started with Kubernetes, you have to have a cluster, right? So you've got to install that cluster. Now, I, I didn't want to switch back and forth between the CLI and the browser too much. So I'm just going to show you real quickly. To get that first cluster installed, it's six pieces of information to our CLI installer. Now, I didn't want to walk through this one because I think what's even cooler is the advanced cluster management. So this puts a GUI in front of managing all of your OpenShift clusters. So if I hop over to our clusters page, you can see I've already got a couple of clusters that I've created. We are going to create one right now. Give this thing a name. And we're going to pick Amazon for this. Then the version of OpenShift that we want, in this case, 452. And this provider connection right here, this is just something, a, a secret I've already set up inside of advanced cluster management that's letting me talk to the cloud provider of my choice. In this case, this is my Amazon keys that I've already set up. Base domain of my cluster. And now I get the flexibility to pick things like, you know what, actually I want this over in US East too. And for availability, I'm gonna load balance this across some availability zones. And I can do the same for my workers. Now, if I don't want to come in and use the UI every time, if I want to automate this, you can flip on this YAML right here. And the, the data that we built up going through this form, you can now take that, go put that into your GitOps workflows or um, uh, whatever automated workflow you might have. And I'm going to go ahead and create this cluster. Now, what this is doing in the background is actually going off and using that same CLI installer that I, I gave you the teaser of initially. It's using that in the background, running that inside a pod. And in about 30-ish minutes, this cluster will get created. Now, I don't want to sit here for 30 minutes letting you guys watch a cluster install. That would be kind of boring, right? So I'm going to go ahead and hop over and watch just to prove it to you real quick. Yes, this cluster is. So what this did, um, this went over to the, there we go. Um, so it's, it's running the install right now. It's going through, it's creating everything over in Amazon. So yes, this really did go and do something in the background. It is not smoke and mirrors. This cluster is creating. So I'm gonna go back over now. So you've got clusters installed, that's great, but 
installing them is only part of the battle, right? You've got to maintain those clusters. Uh, you've got to update the um, the Kubernetes version in there, right? You've got to update the Kubelet and the API server and all those things. So we can make it super easy to upgrade these clusters. So right from here, I can see I've got a bunch of different versions that I could update to. I'm gonna go ahead and pick this latest version and upgrade to 458. I'm gonna jump over and launch over to this prod cluster. And this cluster is updating now. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go look at what's actually happening behind the scenes. So in an OpenShift cluster, there are a bunch of things that we like to call operators. And there are little bits of logic that are maintaining this cluster over time. And this is how we're managing your API server, your cluster, or your container networking, um, your ingress to the cluster. And each one of these operators has a very specific job that it's maintaining. And as the upgrade starts to roll out, each one of these operators will begin to update its particular part of the cluster. Um, you can see it says we're already working towards updating to 458 at this time. Um, so these, these operators aren't just going to handle updates though. And we can see our, our first one is starting to fire off here. It's starting to update. Um, they also actually manage these applications during its normal life cycle. So in the case of etcd here, if we go and take a look at etcd, you'll see what's actually happening with etcd live. So we can see there's no unhealthy members within the etcd cluster. Um, we, we know three members of the cluster are available. So we can see exactly what's going on in each component. Now, if as an administrator, I need to update some configuration for this cluster, that's also managed by these operators. So everything is done through this global configuration. Again, whether it's your API server, your ingress, your DNS. Um, API defined configuration managed by these operators, validated and then rolled out to the cluster. And to show you an example of what one of those configuration looks like, um, you know, you, you care about what's going on in your cluster. If something does go wrong, you want to know about it. So we've made it super easy to create what are called receivers, the thing that's going to get alerts if something goes wrong on your cluster. And you know, whether that's your pager duty, your webhook, your email, your Slack, common ways that you're gonna to wanna to get information about what's happening. And that same cluster install that I did just a second ago, this is the, the experience out of the box that you get when you install one of these clusters, easy uh, creation of, of monitoring. So this monitoring stack that I just teased a little bit, I wanna show you a little bit more about it. So this is built on Prometheus to get those metrics and you can dig deep into the details if you wanted to of, uh, let's say if I wanted node file system. Now you can, you can build complex queries right here. But if you're not a Prometheus guru and you don't know PromQL by heart, it's also already got dashboards to help you understand what's going on in your cluster. Whether that's knowing that, yes, etcd has all three of its members up and, and what's happening with its disk sync. If that's, you know what, I want to know what's going on with the Kubernetes API server. You know, I can quickly go and take a look at that and see how much CPU is it using, how much network is it using, what's the traffic look like. And so these same metrics and dashboards that are providing this experience of understanding the cluster it also is watching all of the workloads on the cluster to see how much is being used. 
And this enables some really cool stuff uh, with auto scaling. So with, with, with Kubernetes, you may already be familiar of some ideas called uh, pod auto scaling. So I have a workload, I have an application, I need to scale that up automatically based on demand. But what happens when your cluster runs out of nodes? You can't schedule any pods. So with OpenShift, we have machine APIs. And these APIs reach out to the cloud and automatically uh, create a machine that can then become a Kubernetes node. When you combine those APIs with autoscalers, you get a really, really cool uh, effect. So here I have the three ma machine sets that were created and machine sets are similar to other Kubernetes ideas, like a deployment scales up a pod, a machine set scales up machines. To go with those, I can create these auto scalers and defining them is really simple. There's not much in here, right? It's what's my min, what's my max, and which machine set am I actually targeting here? And you get one of these for each machine set that you want to scale. So I've set these up already here. And then I've set up a cluster auto scaler, which I'll just show you real quick. Just so you can get an idea of what it looks like. Again, it's it's not got much here necessary in order to make it work. I said, you know what, I don't want you to automatically scale this cluster out beyond 12 nodes because hey, we don't we don't want to spend a fortune, right? So um, I've set it to that. And then I told it, you know what? Yeah, when I don't need it anymore, you can scale me down automatically. And the default is if it's not needed anymore, it'll scale those machines back down after about 10 minutes and then rebalance the workloads. So I'm gonna go back and look at those machine sets again. You can see right now, they're all scaled to one, one machine. And over here, I've got a simple workload, but I've claimed that it requires an entire CPU for every pod. And I am going to now bump that all the way up to 15 pods. So I'm now asking for 15 CPUs in this cluster. We're scaling, we're scaling, and we're stuck. So now what? So what's happening right now? If we go take a look at these pods, we'll see some of them are now in pending. And these pending pods are stuck scheduling. Why? Because we ran out of node space. So we can now see, yep, we have we only have three worker nodes at the moment. They all have insufficient CPU. And then we have our three control plane nodes, which my workload isn't allowed to run on. We can see now though, if we come back to the machine sets, um, just in that little bit of time, it's already said, oh, you know what? I'm out of space. I gotta start scaling up. So these machine sets have bumped up to two, bumped up to three. And if we come over back to our machines, you see it's provisioned new machines out in AWS at this point in those zones. So that's started up an, an Arcos machine booted it up, it's gonna pivot it into the latest version of CoreOS that goes along with this version of OpenShift. And then um, it'll call out, join itself to the cluster and provision it as a node. So that was kind of a whirlwind of the admin experience and how we can make that super easy, but this is DevNation, right? So where's the developer stuff? Well, that's next. I'm going to now hop into the developer persona. So I am now in the perspective, the developer perspective inside OpenShift. And right here, I just have an empty project. And I've got a Git repo. I want to get started. I want to get started quickly. Now, if you've got Helm charts or um, some YAML that you happen to already have, or there's operators installed on this cluster, you can quickly get started with all of those things. But I just got a Git repo, so I'm gonna get started there. Now, what it's doing, it's saying, you know what? I 
I recognize this thing. This is a Node.js repo, and I'm going to go ahead and recommend this Node.js builder for you. And when we create that, that's actually going off and it's fetching the builder down. It's going to pull in my source code. The build has already launched. And you can see it's um, just the, the latest Git that's currently out there. It's pulling it in. It's going gonna, it's gonna to build it. It will um, load the dependencies. The cool Node.js stuff here. And don't worry, this only takes like two more seconds. And it's pushing it and we'll be done right now. So if we come back over to our view, you can see it's already starting up. And so just by putting in a, that one Git repo, I, I have builds. I have deployments and I've got routes into my application set up. Now I'm going to switch over to another project to show you one more thing. So what I've set up in here is the exact same repo. The only thing that is different is I already went over into GitHub and put in a webhook. So it's exactly the same, made exactly the same way. I just configured the webhook. And I am going to take a look right here. See this edit source code. And this is going to load up my code ready workspaces environment. Uh, open up Che. And what I'm going to do right now for you guys is find the H1, say hello to Dev Nation. Gonna save that. And I've got all my font sizes zoomed in here, so it's a little hard to see. And we're gonna push it up. All right, so that, that pushed that change out up to my Git repo. And GitHub is going to fire off that webhook into my cluster, in, into my Node.js demo app. And you can see it already happened. That new build is running. We see we got our dev nation commit there that I just made. So same thing, it's got to pull the code in, uh, do its Node.js thing. And it's got its dependencies. And when we're pushing that into the internal registry into the OpenShift cluster, it's in, it's launching. Starting up, and it's live. Hello, Dev Nation. All right, well, so that was a whirlwind. I hope you saw how easy Kubernetes can actually be through all of that. We think about everything that we just did in that last 25 minutes. We installed, we updated, we showed how to configure, we looked at how to monitor, we automatically scaled the machines in the cluster, we deployed your application and we edited it live in the browser in Code Ready Workspaces. So, thank you, Burr, and back to you.